Welcome back, friends. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for joining us for part two of this series. If you joined us yesterday for part one, thanks for taking the time to do that. I know it uh, might seem a little bit weird to some people to listen to somebody from a church talk about the Bible and not really draw any conclusions, but hopefully that leads you to wanting to dig into the story of Esther for yourself. I mentioned yesterday that We'll get into that on Sunday. We'll start drawing some conclusions on Sunday. So yesterday, today, and tomorrow, you can think of as kind of a setup for Sunday. We'll just tell these three stories. We'll let you know where to find them in the Bible. And then we're going to dig into the meaning of those things on Sunday. Uh, but it might also be worth mentioning right now that if you find yourself impacted by something that you're reading or something that you're seeing, uh, maybe you feel like you're coming to some conclusions, but you're not sure that the right conclusions, well, join the club. Because not only is that okay, but that's really one of the beautiful ways that God works. He definitely speaks in different ways to different people. And if you've ever felt intimidated by the Bible and you've kind of felt like you needed to have people from the church interpret it for you, well, this would be a great time to investigate this on your own or with your family. It doesn't have to be anything earth-shattering. Just ask God to help you understand the things that he wants you to know and, importantly, to have fun with it. All right, so with that in mind, here's the second story. So like yesterday, the story has a king and a young woman in it, but it plays out in a very different way than the story of Esther. Some of you are probably familiar with some of the history of the Israelites and their relationship with God along the way. It tends to be pretty volatile. It's kind of like what we're seeing right now with the stock market, up one day, tanking the next, doing really well, doing poorly, seesaws up and down. That's the Israelites' relationship with God. They go through these cycles of going their own way, creating a big mess for themselves, returning to God, and trying to be faithful again, and then repeating the cycle over and over. Pretty much like all of us, in other words. And in the middle of this chaotic relationship, a guy named Josiah becomes king. And this happens when he's just a kid. He's eight years old when he takes the throne. And it's a pretty huge responsibility for a kid like him. But the story tells us that he was a pretty unique guy. Because while he was still pretty young, only about 16 years old, he makes a decision. And that was in direct contrast to many of the kings and the people who came before him. He decides he's going to follow the God of David. And he's not going to waver in that commitment. And so he decides he's going to put feet to his words and he's going to show people how serious he is about following God. And so he starts this campaign to rid Judah and Jerusalem of any idols, of anything that pretended to take the place of God, of anything that was causing anybody to worship anything or anyone that wasn't the one true God. And he commits to this process for years. And several years into it, he decides that he wants to repair the temple. Now, we don't know a lot about the state it was in, but it had apparently been neglected for some time. And Josiah takes on the task of restoring it, feeling like this was a holy place and it's sure not respecting God or being faithful to him by leaving it in ruins. And so he starts this huge project. And in the middle of all of this going on, the high priest ends up finding this book. It's a book of the law. It's writings that had originally been given to Moses. Now, I don't really know what this says about the high priest, that he had no idea where an important book like this had been all this time. Uh, but I guess it makes some sense. I mean, they had walked away from God and neglected the temple. It kind of stands to reason that the priests might have walked away as well and gone down their own road. Uh, but in any case, he finds the book, and he gives it to the king's secretary, and the secretary reads it to the king. And what the king hears is apparently terrifying, because he tears his robes and he immediately decides, I've got to know more. Kind of like what we were talking about a few minutes ago. We often read things in the Bible that we aren't sure that we fully understand them. And we want to turn to somebody else for insight. Well, this is how Josiah reacts as well. I think I'm hearing a terrible message from God, but I want to be sure. And I want to know what it means for me. And so he sends some people out to see if they can find somebody who can shed a little bit of light on this. And they do end up finding somebody. They find this woman named Huldah. Now... Huldah's not a very well-known character in the Bible. She only shows up in nine verses, and really only in relation to this story. We only know a few things about her. We know she was married. We know where in Jerusalem she lived. And we know she was a prophet. And being a prophet, she had been gifted by God with a particular kind of ability. 
And being a prophet is not really a job or a position. It, you can do or be a bunch of things and also still be a prophet. We know that being a prophet means being somebody that God has given something specific to say. They can be words intended to turn people back to God, words to show people where they're going wrong, uh, sometimes a glimpse into what's going to happen. Sometimes they're words that give clarity in an uncertain time. And it's for that reason that the king's people reach out, out to Huldah. They seem to figure that if someone can make sense of this, it's going to be somebody that God seems to have gifted in a unique way like this. And so they go to, they go to Huldah. And now imagine being Huldah for a second. I mean, it's not every day that the king asks you to weigh in or interpret something. And in particular, something that caused such a terrified reaction in the king. What if what it says and what God asks you as the prophet to say is not well received? What if he decides, as other kings had done, forget this. I'm taking my chances on my own. Oh, and by the way, kill the prophet because we don't really need anybody else hearing what she might have to say. I mean, just because she's a prophet doesn't mean she's immune to all of the fears and normal human emotions that we all feel. This has to be a difficult time for her. There's no guarantee how any of this is going to turn out. Just because Josiah has been following God, he's still pretty young, and who knows how he's going to take this. But whatever went through her head, she accepts the challenge anyway, and this is what she says. So you know all of that anger from God that you read about? That's all true. Because we ignored God and worshipped other idols and did our own thing, God's going to wreak some havoc, essentially. The story says that she tells that God will bring disaster on this place and on these people, and you can see why Josiah was upset when he first heard this in the first place. He's trying to do the right thing and right the wrongs and turn people back to God, and then he hears this message of destruction. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? What about the fact that I'm trying here and I'm trying to follow you, God? I'm trying to turn this thing around. You can imagine all of the things that have got to be banging around in his brain at this point. And then Huldah goes on and says something else. So that destruction part, that's all true. God will do that, but he won't do that to you. Because you responded to God and you humbled yourself and you kept turning to me, I'm going to spare you from that destruction. Wow. So this is a pretty bittersweet message. Destruction's coming, but you're going to be spared. So now Huldah has said what she needed to say, and it's time now for Josiah to respond to it. So here's what he does. He gathers everybody together. Elders, all of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone, top to bottom, and he reads the book to them. And then he does something huge. In their sight, in their presence, he commits himself to following God completely from that moment on to keep his commands with all of his heart and his soul to make everything that he says and does point people towards following God. And then he leads the people in making that commitment for themselves. They create a covenant, essentially, between all of these people and God that they're going to follow him all of their days. And together, they go from there and they remove every trace of anything that people turn to apart from God. It's a huge historic revival of people humbling themselves before God. And the story tells us that as long as those people lived, they never turned away from God. It's a pretty incredible story. It's a story of a king's humility and courage and following God in a time and a place that was pretty hostile to that. And it's the story of a woman being faithful and using her gift when she was called upon to use it. And it ends up resulting in something that changed life as they knew it for a huge number of people. And it changed history. So, like we did for the story yesterday, I want to encourage you to read this for yourself. It's way shorter than the one yesterday. You can find pretty much the whole story in one of two chapters either in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 22, or the book of 2, Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Chronicles, chapter 34. Now, there's a little bit more detail in the chapter in 2 Chronicles, but they're both worth reading. So read through it and just see what comes alive to you. What are you learning? What's challenging to you? Do you see any of yourself and the way they behave? 
um, in, in any of these characters? Do you see, what do you see in how they interact with each other and with God? See if you can start to find any parallels between the story today and the story we heard yesterday about Esther. And then once you hear tomorrow's story, do the same thing with that. And I'm so looking forward to our life groups and friends and family having a good discussion on some of this. And I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on this as well. So I want to say thanks for joining us today. I want to say look out for the third video in the series that will come out tomorrow. Um, and then please join us not only for tomorrow, um, but also on Sunday as we kind of wrap this whole thing up and dig into it further. So I want to pray that the rest of your day is full of really meaningful times with the people around you and that you're taking the opportunity to develop and deepen your relationship with God. It's an uncertain time, but God is not an uncertain God. So go in peace and please know how much you're loved. See ya.